Well, good evening. It's so good to see so many of you here. Um, you know, it's been a while since we've really had big crowds, you know, after the pandemic. And so thank you for joining us in person. And we have lots of people coming in through Zoom, too. So I want to welcome each of you. My name is Sister Kathleen Duffy, and as director of the Institute for Religion and Science at Chestnut Hill College, and president of the American Teilhard Association, I'm pleased to welcome you. And a particularly warm welcome to many of you who are here for the first time, and I suppose that's true on Zoom also. So welcome, and please come back and join us again. So this lecture is co-sponsored by the uh, American Teilhard Association and also by the Institute for Religion and Science at Chestnut Hill College. The American Teilhard Association was established in 1967 to extend knowledge of the cosmic vision of Teilhard de Chardin to encourage its critical study and to apply Teilhard's thought to our current global situation. I encourage you to become a member and we do have the website address here as well as my email address if you need to be in touch. The Institute for Religion and Science is um, a regional center exploring science and spirituality. And it was established 10 years ago to pr promote the constructive engagement of religion, spirituality with science and technology, just what we're going to do tonight. And to encourage dialogue that is interfaith, multi-science and civil. To this end, we sponsor lectures, reading circles, conferences, and other programs. So visit our website or send me an email to, but if you go to our website, you will be able to find some of our, of the um, uh, videos from our previous events and other resources, and also our future events. We don't have them posted yet, but they're, we're, um, we're getting ready to do that. Our reading circles will begin discussing John Hort's book, called The Cosmic Vision of Teilhard de Chardin in January. And so if you're interested in joining us for that discussion, just let me know by sending me an email. And if you're here and are not on our website, just sign up um, at the door there at the reception desk. You can sign up for the, for the um, mailing list that we send you know, whenever we have new events. So this evening we'll proceed in the following way. Dr. Andrew Del Rossi, a member of the board of the American Teilhard Association, will introduce Dr. Joshua Canzona, our speaker for this evening, who will then give his lecture. He will share with us his lecture on this very interesting and relevant topic. And next we will send you if you are on Zoom, we will send you into breakout rooms for about 15 minutes or so. And um, you, there you can discuss the content of the lecture, you know. And what we hope you to, that you will do is to come up with some questions so that when you return to this room or, you know, from the breakout rooms, you'll be able to make a comment or, or ask a question. And especially if you can talk among yourselves, maybe somebody will come up with a question. Uh, for those who, of us who are here, we will break into smaller groups and, and chat also. And there are no official facilitators, so just beware, be aware of each other and be sure everybody gets a chance to speak who wants to. Um, keep your comments short and focused and to the point because we don't have that much time. Uh, if you do have a, a question and you're in the breakout room, you should uh, write it in the chat, and um, Dr. Del Rossi will explain that in a minute. And those who are in person, you just have to raise your hand, and I'll be around with a microphone. So then after 15 minutes in the breakout rooms, you'll receive a warning that, to return 
and you'll be coming back in one minute. And when you return, Dr. Canzona will entertain questions and comments that occurred to you during the lecture. So just so you know what's going on. Dr. Francel, who's in the back, Dr. Francel's from, Michelle Francel's from Bryn Mawr College, a chemist from Bryn Mawr College. She'll collect the questions on chat and I will collect the questions here. And so now I ask Dr. Del Rossi, Andrew Del Rossi, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Kathy. And now, I, along with the Institute for Religion and Science and the American Tarot Association, are proud to present to you Dr. Joshua Canzona, who holds his doctorate in Theological and Religious Studies from Georgetown University, with a dissertation comparing the thought of Pierre Terre de Chardin and Muhammad Iqbal, the intellectual founder, father of Pakistan. His research interests include comparative mysticism, religion and science, and religion and art. Dr. Canzona currently teaches graduate courses on comparative mysticism, Muslim-Christian dialogue, and religion and art at the Wake Forest University School of Divinity and serves as the Associate University Ombudsman at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where he acts as a confidential and alternative dispute resolution resource for a constituency exceeding 40,000 students, faculty, and staff. This evening, Josh will examine the theological status of artificial intelligence, or AI, based on its potential for increasingly complex and even self-reflective consciousness, and drawn from three sources. One, mystical approaches to consciousness in the work of Jesuit scientist Pierre Terre de Chardin. Two, similar panentheistic threads in the work of Muhammad Iqbal, the intellectual father of Pakistan, and three, the Integrated Information Theory, or IIT, developed by neuroscientists Giulio Tononi and Christoph Koch, and consider the viability and consequences of a theological perspective connecting the recognition of God in all things with the recognition of consciousness as a fundamental aspect of reality. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Joshua Canzona. Hi, good evening, everyone. How's that? And you can hear me as well. All right, so we have positive things from the machine already. It's, it's amazing. Uh, I want to say, first of all, thank you. Thank you for everyone who's here tonight. Thank you for everyone joining online. Uh, thank you to the Institute for Religion and Science and the American Tayar Association for hosting uh, me in Philadelphia, I've had a wonderful time, made some great friends, and uh, I really do appreciate it. So thank you, thank you so much. Now, there's a lesson I, I, I have to keep teaching myself because I never seem to learn it. It's one thing to come up with a cool title for a presentation. It is another thing altogether to deliver on the promise of that cool title. But we're gonna do our very best, and we're gonna touch on every one of these topics, and I think well, we're gonna talk about some big, exciting ideas and come up with some big, exciting questions that we, we, we just might not answer tonight, but we'll, we'll try. So if you're, in, if you're in for that with me, if we can do that together, uh, we're gonna to have a good time. Uh, starting with an outline of what we're gonna talk about tonight. So as uh, Andrew said, uh, I will be working uh, on all the themes I just showed you and also from the perspective or through the lens of two important early 20th century thinkers, Muhammad Iqbal and Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. So I'll introduce both of those individuals to you first, and then we will examine their respective reflections on consciousness. Uh, from there, we'll do a comparison of some key themes in both, uh, both of their thought systems concerning consciousness, and then we'll look at some touchstones, implications in scientific research. Uh, particularly artificial intelligence and the study of consciousness generally. So that's, that's our game plan tonight. Iqbal and Taylor, we could talk five hours just about this, but we don't have that time. 
Sir Muhammad Iqbal um, is the intellectual father of Pakistan and um, an incredibly important figure in the Pakistani community. He was born in uh, Sialkot during the British rule in India. Uh, his grandfather had moved to that area from the Kashmir region as part of a mass migration of Muslims. Uh, they were driven out by colonial activities. What had happened is the British had propped up a, a ruler uh, with certain animosity toward Muslims, and so there was a, a mass exodus um, before Iqbal himself was born. Uh, Iqbal is noted for having a very good sense of humor, but also for having a sense of melancholy about him. A melancholy, I think, in part related to the sense of a lost uh, homeland because of these uh, colonialist events. Iqbal also is a celebrated poet, and so he, he wrote this um, about Kashmir. Known once on polished lips as little Persia, downtrodden and penniless as Kashmir now, a burning sigh breaks from the heavens to see their children crouch in awe of tyrant lords. Uh, so Iqbal knew intimately um, the devastation wrought by colonialism. In his early years, his parents were devout Muslims, and he wrote this of his mother. In the scroll of existence, your life was a golden page. Your life was from beginning to end a lesson in faith and the world. And it's hard to overstate the importance of one's mother in Islam. Uh, there's a hadith or a saying of the Prophet Muhammad uh, that paradise is at the feet of one's mother. This uh, seems to be certainly true for Iqbal. His father spent his free hours with Sufis, um, that is, Islamic mystics, and his friends called Iqbal's father an untutored philosopher. The idea is that um, he probably could not read and write, but he spent all of his free hours absorbing wisdom and knowledge from Sufi masters. And for their son, however, they insisted on a formal education. So Iqbal went to a Quran school to learn how to memorize and recite the Quran. He then entered government college in Lahore and studied with uh, Thomas Walker Arnold, who's a famous um, scholar of Islam, uh, what used to be called an Orientalist, someone who had a great mastery of languages. He studied law at Cambridge and then completed a doctorate at the University of Munich. Uh, as I mentioned, he's a celebrated poet and also received a knighthood in 1923 on the basis of his, of his writing. Uh, so he's been called a bridge of understanding between East and West because of these uh, different uh, threads, these educational, academic, intellectual threads that he drew upon. Uh, Supreme uh, Court Justice Douglas, uh, United States Supreme Court Justice, said this of, of Iqbal. He was a great admirer and said that he bridged East and West. Uh, but Iqbal was not always, um, did not always praise the West. I mentioned earlier colonialism. He says this of, of Europe generally, death is all its philosophy's life breath. It is what all its sciences devise. Its submarines are crocodiles with all their predator predatory wiles. Its bombers rain destruction from the skies. Its gases so obscure the sky, they blind the sun's world seeing eye. And you see, I've, I've put this next to an image of uh, the devastation of World War I that Iqbal was well aware of. Now, in some ways, the beginning line of this, the, the philosophy's life breath, it's not just about the technology itself. Iqbal's saying there's some kind of spiritual or philosophical problem here. And to some degree, it's a problem, a disordered relationship with respect to the material world. And so you see an image here from a film by um, filmmaker Eric von Straheim from the 1920s, in a film called Greed, uh, which is this epic silent film. And Straheim had gone in and hand tinted some of the film golden, so that the, the coins, the money glows in the film, and the money was also the source of, of murder. And so you get this sense that when you champion material wealth to such a degree, it has this numinous quality that it glows for you, that that's deeply disordered from Iqbal's point of view. He says this, of, again, of the West. Those parliaments and their reforms, charters and bills of rights, the Western pharmacopoeia swarms with opiate delights. The rhetoric of the senator flowing in fiery stream, God save the mark. The broker's war of gold is its true theme. So again, greed. 
And so you might think, well, does Iqbal discard matter? Does he say material reality is, should be cast aside so that we focus only on the spiritual? And that's not at all what he says. He writes, there is no such thing as a profane world. All this immensity of matter, so everything, constitutes a scope for the self-realization of spirit. And so that's the first important point I want to make, is that for Iqbal, matter and spirit are inseparable, and that through matter, there's a self-realization, a deepening of the spiritual. And that brings us to Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the Jesuit scientist priest, and as you can see, lived about the same time as, as Iqbal, early 20th century, uh, very active. Teilhard, Teilhard was born in a region in central France, and he was also deeply influenced by his parents. His mother was known for her piety and devotion to the Christian mystics and the sacred heart of Jesus. Uh, my understanding is that's a devotional practice developed um, just to the east of where Tayar was born, um, in a different region. His father was keenly interested in natural history, and they, they lived in this volcanic area uh, with all sorts of interesting geological finds, and his father would go out and collect these things, samples uh, from the countryside. And so that, that informed Tayar's youth as well. In The Heart of Matter, which is Teilhard's um, autobiographical essay, it's also in a book collected in a book of the same title that I recommend, he writes this of his, of his mother. That spark through which my universe as yet but half personalized was to attain centricity by being amortized, that spark undoubtedly came to me through my mother. It was through her that it reached me from the current of Christian mysticism and both illuminated and inflamed my childish soul. Now, if there's any words in here that don't make sense, we might be better off at the end of the lecture. But you can see, you can see how important his mother was and the kinds of things he was looking for, illumination. Uh, some life events, Taylor had a fascinating Indiana Jones kind of life. And we don't have time to get into all of it, but I'll mark some key events. Uh, as I said, he was a Jesuit. He entered the Jesuit novitiate in um, 1899. He was ordained a priest in 1911. He was called to service in World War I, where he was uh, a stretcher bearer, among other things. Uh, he was decorated for his, his uh, bravery. He earned a doctorate in geology and then became a, a research scientist, was also teaching. Uh, but he ran into some trouble with church authorities. This is a common problem for mystics across history. He ran into some difficulties with the church. And it, there were a few different reasons. One is that he'd become very interested in the science of evolution and how evolutionary thought uh, could be influenced by and also influence theology. And he was just a bit ahead of the curve on that. The other thing is uh, he had done some writing on original sin that had made its way to church authority somehow. And uh, well, they didn't like it very much. So he was ordered to leave his teaching post and left for China in 1926. It was at least his second trip there, I believe. But at this point in his life, he was rather uh, exiled from his home in France and did a lot of research abroad. Uh, his two most famous monographs, The Divine Milieu and also The Human Phenomenon. And then uh, to end on a high note, in 1950, he was elected to the French Academy of Sciences. So a distinct honor. At the bottom here, I have a quote uh, from the beginning of the human phenomenon. Teilhard writes, seeing. One could say that the whole of life lies in seeing, if not ultimately, at least essentially. And this is uh, extremely important for understanding Teilhard, to understand that he's, he's always looking through one lens or another, sometimes at the very minute, even atomic level, and at other times, a scale as large as the cosmos, cosmic time, deep time. And everywhere, where, what is he looking for? The divine. Uh, one more note from the heart of matter is uh, Teilhard says he's looking for a degree of consistence, uh, convergence. But what does this mean? Well, he says that when he was a small child, he saw a lock of hair being burned up. And it, it greatly uh, disturbed him to see this. 
because this hair that he thought represented some permanence can be turned into ash and smoke. So there's no permanence there. There's nothing that lasts necessarily. So then, understandably, he seeks out something that's permanent, durable. And he, gets, uh, he looks for big pieces of iron, he says, like a big, big bolt. Uh, but the difficulty with iron is that it gets rusty. And you might come upon some iron that's rusted so badly that it can break apart in your hands. So there's no, the durability, the permanence, it's not really there. Well, maybe it's in fire itself, but fire gets extinguished. So there too, this, this search for permanence and consistency uh, left him wanting. And so he says, it's not an effect of substance, but of convergence. And he comes later to the realization that matter and spirit, these were no longer two things, but two states or two aspects of one and the same cosmic stuff. So you see here, we're already coming to some similarities with Iqbal and vice versa. He writes in the Divine Milieu, at the heart of our universe, each soul exists for God and our Lord. But all reality, even material reality, around each one of us, exists for our souls. Hence, all sensible reality around each one of us exists through our souls for God and our Lord. So again, a deep, profound relationship between matter and spirit and a profound responsibility through matter toward the deepening of spirit. We'll talk more about this. Let's reflect back on Iqbal for a second and on the theme, the idea of consciousness. Now, the first question we have to answer if we're going to talk about consciousness is what is it? How do we define it? I have here three definitions. We'll see if we like any of them. Uh, these are all drawn from a book, Consciousness Confessions of a Romantic Reductionist, by the scientist uh, Christoph Koch, uh, who's now currently working at the Allen Institute. I think his title is Chief Scientist. Uh, but he's uh, famously been a, a researcher into consciousness for decades and had a long relationship with Francis Crick, uh, where they were both interested in similar ideas. So Koch tells us three definitions. One is a common sense definition. Uh, I like this one. It equates consciousness with our inner mental life. When you go to sleep tonight, you will not be conscious. When you wake up, you will be conscious. And that's what consciousness is. It's that experience of being aware and awake. Um, in his second book, or his book after uh, the one I just cited, it's titled, The Feeling of Life Itself. This is consciousness common sense definition. Also, he mentions a behavioral definition, a checklist of actions or behaviors that would certify as conscious any organism that could do one or more of them. So you could imagine being in the hospital, the ER, and something's happened to you and the doctors or the nurses are going through a checklist to see how conscious you really are in that moment. Your behavior determines what gets checked off. It determines perhaps some kind of score at the end. Or perhaps we could use a neuronal definition, which is about the architecture of the, of the brain, specifying the minimal physiologic mechanism required for any one conscious sensation. So for example, uh, one needs a functioning brainstem for, for seemingly every conscious sensation. And you could do that for other aspects of the brain's architecture. And if you want to know more about that, don't ask me. I'm a theologian. But uh, <laughs> there, are, there are people who can answer those questions. But we need a definition for Iqbal. What's consciousness for Iqbal? And I'm showing an image here of a book titled The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam, which is Iqbal's um, kind of his uh, signature work for his philosophical thought. Uh, so I recommend that title for those wanting to learn more about Iqbal. Uh, it's a difficult book, so bring your coffee, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's excellent. Iqbal refers to consciousness as a level of experience. Experience as unfolding itself in time presents three main levels, the level of matter, the level of life, 
in the level of mind and consciousness. And Iqbal is interested in research and the gathering of knowledge, so he says these are the subject matter of physics, biology, and psychology, respectively. So already we can see that uh, consciousness is an experience, and it's one that can be studied or, or researched, reflected upon to produce knowledge. For Iqbal, consciousness is an inner reality. He says, my perception of things that confront me is superficial and external. Like I, I see chairs and a water bottle. But my perception of my own self is internal, intimate, and profound. He writes also, conscious experience is the privileged case of existence in which we are in absolute contact with reality, capital R. And an analysis of this privileged case is likely to throw a flood of light on the ultimate meaning of existence. So consciousness, capital R, reality. But why would he say such a thing? Where, where might this be coming from? There's a verse in the Quran, and let me, let me say first off that in the, the Muslim tradition, uh, the Quran purports to be God's direct speech to humanity. So if, if you're a Christian, you may have seen what are, what are called sometimes red letter Bibles. And the red letters are words uh, often that Jesus is directly saying. Well, for the Quran, all the letters are red because it's God's direct speech to humanity. So in the Quran, God says, and we, the royal we, right? and we, have already created man and know what his soul whispers to him, and we are closer to him than his jugular vein. So God is so intimately close to the human being, and if consciousness is intimately close to the human being, well, for Iqbal, this is an inner reality that you can explore to perhaps come closer to God. Iqbal also says, consciousness provides a direct vision of duration. And duration is a concept he's borrowed from uh, Henri Bergson, who was a French philosopher, very famous at the time and still, who had had a great influence on both Teilhard and Iqbal. It's, it's no accident that they're, they're so easy to compare. But what does he mean? Here's what Bergson says about duration. Pure duration is the form which the succession of our conscious states assumes when our ego lets itself live, when it refrains from separating, okay? When it refrains from separating its present state from its former states. So no counting, no separating, none of that. Iqbal says, a keener insight into the nature of conscious experience, however, reveals that the self in, her, in its inner life moves from the center outward, so the unseparated center. And Iqbal also distinguishes between what he calls the efficient self and the appreciative self. Now, what does that mean? The efficient self has to do with the separating and the counting. The appreciative self is the, the more inner self and perhaps the most, more profound reality. He writes, with our absorption in the external order of things necessitated by our present situation, it is extremely difficult to catch a glimpse of the appreciative self. We're so busy separating and counting and moving through the world and all of our responsibilities, it's difficult to look inward and encounter the glimpse of the appreciative self and the Arabic I have there, that, that word is uh, batin, which means hidden. In Sufism and Islamic mysticism, there's this notion of things that are hidden to, to, be, to be discovered. And for Iqbal, it seems to me, this is true of the appreciative self. He writes, in the life process of this deeper ego, the states of consciousness melt into each other. So it's not just that it's unified, but almost that it's synthesizing. Synthesizing. And so there we have the Arabic tawhid, which is um, uh, unity, oneness, the, the fundamental principle of Islam that, that God is one. And if God is a unity, perhaps everything else trends toward unity as well. 
And then finally, he says, the operation of the past in the present is not the whole of consciousness. For, for Bergson, perhaps that's it, the past in the present. For Iqbal, he says, purposes not only color our present states of consciousness, but also reveal its future direction. So consciousness has a future. The word there is uh, kader, which means um, uh, power or even possibly destiny, a future. And you can, you can think already, those of you who, who are interested in Tayar, just think of the titles of some of the books, the activation of energy toward the future, the future of man. Uh, Iqbal as well, very, very forward looking. Iqbal also talks about I amness, which is rather like uh, selfhood. I amness, I am. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. So there's this, this self of this I amness. Iqbal says, I have conceived the ultimate reality as an ego, God as, as, as an ego, as person. And I must add now that from the ultimate ego, only egos proceed. The creative energy of the ultimate ego in whom deed and thought are identical functions as ego unities. So wait a second, is he saying that everything is an ego unity? Uh, really? He writes, every atom of divine energy, however low in the scale of existence, is an ego, has to some extent something we could call consciousness, has that capacity of I amness to some extent. In one of his poetic works, The Secrets of the Self, he writes, Though I am but a moat, the radiant sun is mine. Within my bosom are a hundred dawns. Tis the nature of the self to manifest itself. In every atom slumbers the might of the self. In every atom, there's God. And that brings us back to Tayar, consciousness and Tayar. What does he mean by consciousness? He writes in The Human Phenomenon, in a footnote, mind you, you got to read the footnotes. Here, as elsewhere in this book, the term consciousness is taken in its broadest sense to designate every kind of psyche, from the most rudimentary forms of interior perception conceivable to the human phenomenon of reflective consciousness. So every kind of psyche, but there's a special distinction for self-reflective consciousness. So is he saying like Iqbal, that consciousness is everywhere? He writes, at every size, cosmic particles in relation to themselves, they are psychic centers. And at the same time, they are infinitesimal psychic centers of the universe. In other words, consciousness is a universal molecular property. It's, it's fundamental, it's simple, it's, it's everywhere. Consciousness is not an epiphenomenon of, of evolutionary progress. It's, it's built into everything from the beginning. And this has to do with uh, Teilhard's thought overall. He has this notion of what's called radial energy, um, the development of consciousness through duration, essentially the power and progress of love. So he writes, considered in its full biological reality, love, that is to say the affinity of being with being, is not peculiar to man. It is a general property of all life, and as such it embraces in its varieties and degrees all of the forms successively adopted by organized matter. So of love, he's saying that my relationship with my wife, it's love. With my friends, love but also when two atoms come together, or two, or two or more atoms come together to form molecules, and molecules come together to form the most rudimentary life, that that attractive energy that, that is pulling evolution forward, that's love too. That is love working in the universe. Love is that attractive energy. He has this idea that some of you may be familiar with of successive stages of Genesis that you can imagine out in the cosmos, rocky bits coming together to form a planet 
And so you have a sphere of rock, you have geogenesis. And you can imagine on that planet, perhaps, perhaps, it's struck by a meteor. And there's, there's a kind of a crevice or a hole where molecular bits can come together and they form the beginnings of biological life and it fans out. And the planet gets covered in biological life and you have biogenesis, a sphere around the sphere. And then that same love energy is drawing a process forward of increasing convergence. And life develops and develops to the point of deepening levels of consciousness. Uh, the cat perhaps has more than the insect. And human beings have that special, that, that self-reflective consciousness. And so we have this psychogenesis and uh, of thought covering the biosphere. So a sphere around a sphere around a sphere. And then he even goes so far to, as to suggest that maybe somehow these consciousnesses will form together in what he calls the noosphere, uh, which is a mysterious thing that we'll have to talk about some other time. But you have what he calls the axis of complexity consciousness that you can, again, seeing, you can look at evolution and see an axis of increased complexity leading to deepening, more profound levels of consciousness. Of the human brain, he writes, it is in his brain that the two foci attain their obvious maximum complexity. In that organ where thousands of millions of cells are grouped in such a way as to constitute a transmitting and receiving and coordinating center of which we can form only a very imperfect idea. And my understanding from what, from what I understand from brain science is that we still have a pretty imperfect idea. I gather we're working to map the brains of mice and worms, so the human brain uh, quite, quite a bit further off. The image here shows uh, imaging that detects water molecules to show the connectivity of a human brain. Interesting study from Ellen Kuehl writing in Nature Physics. The number, size, shape, and position of neuronal cells present during brain growth all lead to the expansion of the gray matter, known as the cortex relative to the underlying white matter. And so this puts the cortex under compression, leading in turn to a mechanical instability that causes it to crease locally. So she's studying the physics of what makes the brain crease and fold. And so we see here this idea of, of expansion then turning inward an involution toward a, a, a deepening, ultimately a deepening consciousness and a deepening within for human beings. And for Teilhard, this, this kind of thinking is, is a, a key part to how he works. Uh, remember again, I talked about that meteorite crater. You have a compressed space and a deepening within that then produces this bursting forth of biological life, potentially. Also important for Teilhard, this notion of personalization. Remember we were talking about the I am before? Personalization. The I, which only subsists in becoming more and more itself in the degree to which it makes everything else itself, the person in and through personalization. This idea of, of the I, which is really the divine, the love, working its way through the world. Any increase that I can bring upon myself or upon things is translated into some increase in my power to love and some progress in Christ's blessed hold upon the universe. So what's happened is we talked about this, this love energy drawing evolution forward, but now in the case of the human beings with self-reflective consciousness, well, we can participate actively. We can be the, the agents bringing love into the world. We, we can choose to build up the earth through love and togetherness and companionship and convergence, all of these things. And that is critical to Teilhard, love. Okay. So I think you've already picked up on some common themes, but I'll, I'll recite a few that I think are important. The first is this idea of duration um, borrowed from Bergson. Consciousness can be examined across time, both the history of an individual 
perhaps, perhaps Iqbal puts more emphasis there, but also evolutionary cosmic time even, it's key. And consciousness has a sense of purpose. We heard it in Iqbal and we heard it in Tayar, love. It's moving toward the future. Consciousness is also characterized by unity and indeed it's experienced as unified. You know, you and I, we experience our consciousness as one and perhaps it tends toward greater unity still, synthesizing other experiences. Convergence, the idea of movement and duration and the blending together of individual elements. It's present especially in Teilhard, but again in both thinkers, the idea of the appreciative self being a synthesizing agent in Iqbal. And finally, I haven't used the word yet, panpsychism. Panpsychism is this idea that consciousness is ubiquitous. This recognition that all things have a within, this is panpsychism. In some ways, it's an answer to what's called the hard problem of consciousness, this idea that how can matter give rise to consciousness? Because consciousness seems so very different than all of the material things. So how, how does it come? How does it come from the matter? Well, it's built in fundamentally. And it's just a matter of having the right degree of complexity to produce the consciousness. Panpsychism. And then finally, divine reality. Consciousness is an extension of divine reality. That is, panpsychism is, is a part of what's called panentheism. This idea that God is in all things, all material things in the universe, but God is also greater than the universe. And again, I think we find this in both Iqbal and Tayar. Now that brings us to some contemporary research, some implications, some big questions. Let's talk about those next. Good question to ask is, okay, panpsychism, is that a popular idea? Well, it used to be. In the 19th century, it had a real heyday. And it's a, a very old idea, going back to Greek philosophy. But interestingly, in 2016, the science writer George Johnson said panpsychism is moving beyond the fringe. He noted uh, publications and uh, presentations at scientific conferences that mention panpsychism. In 2020, the Science of Consciousness Conference at the University of Arizona, it had a session, an entire panel, asking, is the universe conscious? Oxford UP has a book out, Panpsychism, Contemporary Perspectives. It's in their Philosophy of Mind series. So there's, there's some movement, some buzz around this topic, yes. And that brings us back to Christoph Koch. And there's, a, there's the cover image of his book. And he writes in that book, I believe that consciousness is a fundamental and elementary property of living matter. It can't be derived from anything else. It is a simple substance. In other words, panpsychism. And he believes this as, a, as an important element in what's called integrated information theory. What does that mean? The explanation is in the, is in the name. Information, meaning differentiation. So the availability of a very large number of conscious experiences in the human mind, right? That if you're having an experience, you're excluding all of the other experiences you could be having. And so there's a very high level of this differentiation. But also increased or profound integration. So the unity of the experience and the integration, the complexity, as it were, of the human brain, which we've discussed previously. These this, this is the theory of consciousness, that these two things, the integrated information. It, it brings consciousness, consciousness forth from the matter where it's at, panpsychism. So this, of course, it pairs well with Iqbal because of the emphasis on the unity of conscious experience, for one reason. It aligns with Teilhard, his insistence on the whole as more than just the sum of its parts. So for everyone we've talked about, the whole being more than just the sum of its parts. Koch says, the more integrated and differentiated a system is, the more conscious it is. 
which means that for Koch, you too could draw a diagram that's essentially an axis of complexity consciousness. It doesn't have necessarily the same implications as it does for Teilhard, but the idea is the same, that you have the, the human as currently the leading edge of this movement of complexity consciousness. What else can IIT, Integrated Information Theory, do? Well, it's, it's measurable. IIT introduces this concept called phi. It's the measurement of the synergism or holism of a network. It's intrinsic causal power is how they refer to this. The degree to which the whole exceeds the sum of the parts. So here in one article, Tononi et al., they write, the distance D between two probability distributions, the cause effect repertoire specified by the whole mechanism is compared against the cause effect repertoire of the partitioned mechanism. Now, I rely on the scientists and mathematicians in this room to understand this better than I do, but I'll give it a try. It's the idea that if you cut my brain into pieces somehow and looked at the cause effect power of the individual bits, that they would now be less, even if you add them all together, than what the whole is capable of. And so that extent to which the whole exceeds the sum of its parts because it's integrated, that's your phi, that's your measure of consciousness. The problem is that for human brains at least, this kind of measurement involves massive, massive computations. And so it's a, a theory uh, on its way perhaps to someday being more fully tested. This definition is somewhat functionalist. You and I find ourselves in a cosmos in which any and all systems of interacting parts possess some measure of sentience. And he's saying systems of interacting parts rather than organic systems of organic parts. So we got the panpsychism, and we're also getting the notion that this isn't necessarily organic, at least in his book, um, his, his first book. Functionalism applied to consciousness means that any system whose internal structure is functionally equivalent to that of the human brain possesses the same mind, meaning that you, you could argue that consciousness is substrate independent, that if you could get that same level of information and integration in a computer, then you, you would have consciousness there too, based on this theory. Uh, but it seems to me he's, he's somewhat amended this view. In a 2019 article for Scientific American, Koch emphasizes the difference between a simulacrum of a brain and the intrinsic causal power inherent to its structure. So in other words, what he's saying is that, um, and he uses this example, he used it in this article, his, his most recent book, The Feeling of Life Itself, which I recommend makes this point, and he also made this point last month in a conference at the Vatican, Vatican City. He says that um, if you were to simulate a brain in a computer, like upload all the information of my brain into a computer, you would have an excellent simulation. And if it were like Alexa and had a voice, uh, you could talk to it and ask it questions, and it would sure seem like Josh is still living in this, this, uh, this giant Alexa. But... Uh, the fact is, the Alexa, the new Josh, would not have any inner reality. There'd be no within, no conscious experience. He's saying it's like the simulation of weather. Like you could make a computer that does all these atmospheric predictions and predicts the weather, but it's not raining inside the computer. You don't have bits in there that are, that are going to make it rain. He's saying it's the same for this upload of, of uh, all the information in my brain. So what you would need then, you know, a fully conscious AI would need some kind of neuromorphic hardware, uh, which is perhaps well off into the, in the distant future. So multiple problems with getting to a fully conscious AI, and it has to do with massiveness of com computation, our inability to fully map and understand the human brain at this point, and then also there might be hardware necessities, this neuromorphic hardware. And so that brings us to a point I want to make about artificial intelligence. 
as an exercise in theological anthropology, if we get to this idea that AI is indeed, has, has consciousness, has self-awareness, as an exercise in theological anthropology, we might have to consider the ethics of AI in relationship to consciousness. So consciousness as spirit and an expression of divine love. If we, if we follow along with Iqbal and Tayar, consciousness is spirit and an expression of divine love that deepened within. And if somehow in the future that becomes possible for AI, there will be ethicists who say, you can't at this point mistreat the AI. You cannot turn it off. That would be wrong. It's sentient. It, might, it suffers. I am saying there's a theological argument here as well, that that deepened within that consciousness might be a sign of the divine, and you shouldn't turn that off either. It's just an idea, just a thought, but I think it's interesting. I want to give the last word um, to Iqbal Tayar, to, to, to mystical realities, to love. Iqbal writes, the luminous point whose name is the self is the life spark beneath our dust. By love, it is made more lasting, more living, more burning, more glowing. From love proceeds the radiance of its being and the development of its unknown possibilities. Tayar writes, the day will come after harnessing the ether, the winds, the tides, gravitation, we shall harness for God the energies of love. And on that day, for the second time in the history of the world, man will have discovered fire. And then finally, I have a Hadith Qudsi, which is a special saying of the prophet, which is the speech of God once again. God says, the wisdom of my creating you is to see my vision in the mirror of your spirit and my love in your heart. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Canzona. Give it up one more time for Josh. <clears throat> that was certainly a rich presentation, gave us all a lot to think about. And as we now transition over into our breakout rooms on Zoom, and those of you in person will have the opportunity to break out in some small discussion groups, um, I would encourage those of you that are on Zoom to use the chat, to discourse with each other, to post questions, and then when we move back into the large group session for Josh to re-engage with you again with those questions, you can use the chat there to post those questions for us. Just be sure you're posting them to everyone in the group so that our admins can see them on there. Thank you. All right. So can I ask those in this group, in this room, to uh, come back together as a one big group? Talk about unity. Okay, I hope you had good uh, conversations, as, as I hope that was true, too, in your small breakout groups. So we're going to begin with a question uh, that Michelle Francel has from, uh, actually, it was sent in earlier, so Michelle will let me share the microphone, yeah. Thanks, Kathy. So this is, um, what are the necessary ethical and moral factors implemented prior to the input of data into an AI? That's a good question. It's a difficult one, I think. Um, one requiring, I think, many, many conferences all its own. I, I'll say this, that uh, you know, part of what I was talking about was the idea of a, f a fully conscious or sentient AI. And I think this question is speaking to the idea, another aspect of AI that we're confronting right now, which is the existence of sort of algorithms or machine learning systems that pr produce results that impact real human lives. So you can imagine, for instance, however Facebook might choose to put in my newsfeed 
and there's this idea that um, it can shape the way I'm thinking perhaps politically and things like this to be more extreme or radicalized and that this is in some way an extension of what might be called AI. AI in sort of the information sense rather than the, the consciousness sense. And so that, that brings with it many ethical implications. For instance, what if my insurance company uses AI to discern pricing? And what if the data that's being used to inform that AI is uh, discriminatory, um, shaped in ways that um, disenfranchise people based on their identity, their protected class? Well, the data's flawed, so the result's going to be flawed. The, the, the data speaks, it, it is of injustice. The result would be of injustice. And so that, I think, is the kind of question being asked. And these are the kinds of considerations off the top of my head that I, I, would, I would want in the forefront of the minds of those who develop these systems and, and um, choose which data to put in. Uh, but again, distinct from the, the idea of, of consciousness, but an absolutely um, incredibly important question for us right now. Um, I'm going to try to try to ask this question the same way I asked asked it um, in our group. Um, so, regarding the divine and consciousness, are you? Is it that anybody who's conscious, any any being that has consciousness, that is the divine in them? They're one and the same, and that's how the divine comes to conscious beings. So I think that's a, that's a really great question. I, I guess the question I have, so I'm, ans I'm answering a question with a question, is that the only way? Uh, I, I would, perhaps not, but it is one of the most distinctive ways and certainly in, in this idea I think that in our reflective, our self-reflective consciousness that we too can contribute to this, this sort of cosmic passion and drama that we, we can if it flows along this ancient mystical principle of emanation and return, that all things are from God and all things will return to God, and in our self-reflective consciousness, we can affect that journey home. I, I think that is, is part of the, the divinity that people like Iqbal, Teilhard, and so many others see um, in the human being. In, in consciousness, this is one lens one context, one way of talking about that divinity, that, um, that destiny. So I hope that's somewhat helpful. But I, I'm asking myself the same thing all the time. So we have another question coming from the people who are on Zoom. And this is, is AI another step in evolution? Another good question. I'm going to answer it like this. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, Teilhard has this idea of the noosphere. Remember I was talking about geogenesis and biogenesis? So the noosphere is this idea that, in part, that individual consciousnesses could somehow form together to form this new breakthrough. And it, to me, it's rather mysterious. Uh, to me, I, I, what is this breakthrough for Teilhard? I say it's the body of Christ. But there's other ways to read the question that are either divergent or um, just a, a slightly altered reading, which might be that, that human technology is part of how this noosphere could be affected. And so it's plausible that artificial intelligence would play a major role in this idea of the developing noosphere. If it's AI that brings us into greater connection with each other, AI that, that allows us to do uh, new things for and with love. Uh, I, th I think that would be a Teilhardian answer to that question. Now, whether w what do I think, I don't know. I don't know what the next step of evolution will look like. Um, but I, knew, I know that this idea of playing a part is, is incredibly important to me. Shall we give it to the chat? Okay, good. 
Yeah, so um, this is kind of more of a, a metaphysical question regarding how, I guess, consciousness relates to, I guess, like, subatomic particles and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Like, w would it be more accurate to say that, like, consciousness is kind of like an accidental quality of those particles? Mm -hmm. Or would it be, like, almost accurate to say that it's, like, almost like the Kantian, like, uh, noema or something of those particles? It's, like, the true essence mm -hmm. is consciousness. Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question. Um, it's easy to say I don't know. I think that um, what is the answer for Iqbal and Tayar? I think the answer first is that you can't separate matter from spirit, that they're, they're fundamentally linked. Um, so that's one aspect of the answer. I think the other answer is, is that this idea that consciousness is, is fundamental um, means just that that it's inextricably linked with every particle that is. Is that answered a little bit? Um, I think another question I might ask is, you know, what, what, what about outside of the universe? I think all of this, um, one person said that uh, everything of Tayar is a meditation on death. And so the question might be, if, if this is inextricably linked with matter, then what is outside of the universe? Is there any kind of life beyond the death of the universe? And maybe I'm going in a different direction, but um, you know, again, I, I do not know the answer, but Teilhard said, and I think Iqbal would agree, that this notion of purpose and this notion of moving toward the future means that we must have a future, that, that, and that means we must have some kind of um, carried on existence. So I hope that's an interesting answer that didn't respond to your question is what I hope. <laughs> So we have another question from the chat, and this is, does AI or will AI have sentience? And if so, so two separate questions. The second one is, um, how will we know? It's a great question. Um, you know, people like Christoph Koch and his team are working on just this question, and I think insofar as I understand his thought, um, he, he says, no, not anytime soon. Uh, it will not have sentience, but if were it to do so, it would need this kind of um, technology that would allow um, a real recreation of the architecture of the human brain, that that would be essential. And how would we know is another good question, because think about this. If you copy my, my, the information of my brain into a computer box and you ask it, hey, are you sentient? Well, it's me you copied, so it's going to say yes, but it's not really. Because the theory is suggesting that, uh, uh, that sentience, that this, this consciousness, is uh, measurable by, by phi, and the argument would be that this, this is just not possible given that architecture. So again, if so far as I understand their thinking, the answer is that you would know by being able to measure phi and by also having a certain kind of architecture that the, um, would, would allow for this, this, this consciousness to arise. So just asking the question would not be enough. I think there are many clever people who would have um, other really good answers to this, but that's one. Anyone here? Is, is anybody asking the question of whether AI would have a virtue, uh, beginning with like the idea of virtue? Mm -hmm. uh, like Pavlov's dogs, like you know, simple, you know, you know, reward and punishment and, you know, but, but uh, beyond that, you know, the, the, you know, the, ideas, the ideas that people had had something to do with, uh, with, with progress, uh, good progress. But has anybody asked about whether, you know, the advance of AI would, would bring virtue along with it? So I want to make sure I understand what you're asking. Um, virtue in the sense that it would bring virtue to the world or for the AI itself? Mm -hmm. I see. I think that's a, that's a great question that's um, you know, relevant right now, of course, because the kind of AI I was talking about a moment ago that's determining our lives in all kinds of ways that we might not even be aware of, these algorithms that, that determine what's on my screen, all of that. Um, 
Is that increasing virtue? Is it increasing civic virtue? It seems to me no. It seems to me things are sometimes worse because of some of these processes. So that's worrisome, and I think people are asking that question. Now, whether some kind of perhaps imaginary, well, at the moment, definitely imaginary, sentient AI itself has virtue, I, I suppose I would ask of that idea the same question I would ask of uh, a newborn human being. You know, what, what, what creates virtue? Is it, is it how that person's treated, how that person is formed? how that person is loved and, 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 and it's taught to, yeah, to I'll, I'll, I'll it's shown that it, it, to be loved and that you too can love. And maybe that's true of um, this imaginary artificial consciousness as well. So two, two different answers, but really, I think that's the profound question, I really do. So we have a comment from the, um, from the chat. Um, I think of singularity the technology illuminates, animates, and makes global connection possible. Yeah, I was, I was asked um, earlier today by my friend Andrew, he was asking me uh, what would Teilhard say of science right now, the technological developments right now. And I, I can't answer that question. I think it's, it's, there's so much exciting stuff going on that I think Teilhard would be just utterly floored like a kid in a candy store, the wonders of, of everything that's happening right now. Um, but I think he would be most invested in the capacity of any technology to connect the globe and bring people closer together. And Teilhard was an optimist of the sort that he would look to the good and say that uh, you know, the, the things we're taught, the ethics, the bad, the, the potential misuse, that these things will fall away because the good will overpower. I think Teilhard would ultimately say that because Teilhard had faith and he believed in, in this, this sort of destiny, this power of love. Is there any other question here in the, in the floor? I think maybe we've finished the chat. All right, one more. A little bit of a comment and then uh, and ask uh, Josh to you know, have a final word here uh, based on a conversation that we had this morning. Um, but uh, you know, the question of AI and virtue and uh, also acknowledging too, I think the reality in which these technologies are being developed and that the military industrial complex is a very real and strong and large thing. And a lot of these technologies are developed within that context. So. I think that provides some, you know, <laughs> just painting with a broad brush, but it provides some context for intentionality is like the question behind it, right? Um, but, um, you know, in that and the, uh, the intense and radical hope that Teilhard had that you just talked about, Josh, you brought up a great point this morning about his role in uh, being enlisted during the First World War. And I was just thinking uh, it would be nice if you could, you know, maybe comment or close with that. Uh, it was just so appropriate to these questions. Thanks. Good. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to do that. I, I think, and I, this is true of Iqbal as well. I don't want to forget Iqbal. Um, you know, he and Tayar both lived at a time where they, they saw enormous devastation. Tayar, um, he saw the hydrogen bomb. He saw World War II. He saw and served in World War I. And so a critique that's often leveled against Teilhard is that he's too optimistic. He has too much hope for the future of humanity. And uh, he's accused essentially of being naive, naive about technology, naive about people, naive about the future. And I can understand where that critique is coming from. But Teilhard also served in the trenches of World War I. Uh, he had men die on the battlefield in his arms. And I think when someone has lived that reality and he tells you, I still have hope, that I think, I think you have to take that very, very seriously. And so that's, that's my, my first comment. And my second is, is for me, with Tayar, with all the Christian and Islamic mystics, with Julian of Norwich, for instance, I think it is incredibly important to remain cognizant of the power of love and to maintain that sense of hope, that hope that, that uh, 
all will be well, all manner of things shall be well. And so that's, that's the sentiment I carry with me, and I, I hope you will carry with you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Josh. So this was certainly a good evening, and I, I'm just so glad for all of your presence and for such a wonderful talk by uh, Josh. Uh, it was worth your trip from North Carolina, right? He came all the way here to, to give us this talk. So uh, we don't have anything scheduled yet, but we do have um, email addresses, and uh, uh, let me see if I can go up or down. Yeah, and there's... Uh, the American Tayard Association uh, website. Uh, if you're here. Yes, I'm in here. And we'll make the uh, official yet uh, impromptu announcement now that the American Tayard Association will be releasing a podcast come in January of 2022. So that's also something to look forward to. We recorded an episode this, just this morning with uh, Dr. Canzona. So that's something to be excited about. So we're excited about all the little things we're doing as we go along. What's wrong? No? Okay. All right. So thank you again, and um, we hope to see you back again, you know, as soon as we can. Um, if you're on our mailing list, you'll be sure to get the information. Okay? Have a good night. Be careful driving home and be safe. And uh, blessings. Thank you. Thank you.